So good morning and welcome to Leaders Up Close. Uh, this is the seminar series that is part of the Engineering Leadership and Innovation Institute. I'm Tim Kotner, director of uh, that institute. Today we have with us uh, Dr. Ron Bennett. And, and Ron is going to share his story with you about engineering, engineering leadership. As I've shared with you, I met Ron this summer, and he's got a great wealth of experience. And he led engineers. And now he's helping produce engineering leaders. Uh, and so it was great for us to learn from him and, and hear his stories and his advice on how we can go do this and do it better. And I know he's going to give you some great advice. Uh, we appreciate Duke Energy for supporting the seminar series, which allows us to bring in folks like Ron. And Ron will share his story with us. So, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Ron Bennett. Thanks, Tim. Thanks very much, Tim and, and, uh, and Jack, for inviting me here, and for all of you for, for coming. Can you all hear me? Okay. If any time you can't, raise your hand or do something like that. All right. Uh, I had a chance to meet with a few of you before uh, the session today and just introduce myself and ask you what you hope to learn. And a number of you had some really specific kinds of things and others more general. But during uh, our discussion today, I'd like you to be thinking about what you hope to learn. And at any time when we're talking, feel free to raise your hand and ask a question or make a comment or ask me to clarify something, anything you want. All right. Uh, as, as I was preparing for this, I was thinking about when I was uh, at your age and your position in school, um, and, the, and the thought that would be in my mind is, after you, especially after you hear me talk, is, if he can do it, why not me? <laughs> You'll find that uh, I have not done nothing uh, extraordinary at all. Uh, it's just I follow the path of interest, of what I was interested in. So I want to tell you a little bit about that story and that path because it's certain transition points in that path that really have um, continued to stimulate my interest, as, as Tim mentioned, in, in you and how do, how do we that have had some experience share that experience in a way that helps you um, not avoid some of the failures we have but, but to learn more quickly what, what your experiences mean to you and help you identify what your passions really are. So, uh, I started out pretty much a uh, great family, a uh, grandfather that let me, you know, when I was six years old, climb on the roof and put shingles on with them. Just, just a good environment to be in. Very supportive folks, small town Wisconsin. And I was interested in tinkering with stuff. And, you know, as soon as I got my hand on a chunk of two-inch diameter TV mast and some mast heads and some black powder, I built a rocket. And... It was pretty dangerous, but I didn't know that. And uh, you know, we never found it. Um, it <laughs> flew off somewhere. Uh, and then there was a, a guy in a local shop that, that fixed radios. They used to do that. And uh, he helped me get interested in, in building electronics. And so he led me to a, a schematic for a, a radio, and I built a three-tube transistor, or vacuum tubes. Some, anybody know what a vacuum tube is? That's a thing to look up if you don't know what it is. They're kind of cool. Um, and I started a radio station mostly to annoy my grandmother because I could broadcast into her house and do stuff. Okay, so it was motivated by some very selfish kinds of things. But I, I was pretty good in science and math in, in school. And, and, uh, and when it came time to figure out um, what I wanted to do and go into college, I, had, I was thinking about careers. And one of the questions that I know some of you students have is, well, how early did you know what you wanted to be? And I was telling Jack and Tim that I had it narrowed down pretty tight by the time I was a senior in high school. I either wanted to be a nuclear physicist, a mortician, okay, a priest, or a Coast Guard officer. Okay, that's how tight it was. All right. So um, after high school, I got married before I started college. My wife and I started college together. I did four years of bachelor's in math and physics at the University of Wisconsin at Eau Claire. And by the time we were out of college, um, I got a scholarship uh, from the Atomic Energy Commission to go on to study nuclear physics in grad school, and two kids and a family. And, um, and I had worked. I started working in high school when I was 14. I had 20 hours a week. I worked in the newspaper in circulation. And when I, when I got into college, I thought I, thought I was interested in science. Uh, physics really interested me. And I never thought about engineering. And, and it, you know, it's like one of those, duh, why didn't I think of this? Um, 
uh, in college, uh, I added another job. I, I rebuilt humidifiers with a local appliance company, Presto Industries. And uh, I found out I didn't want to do line work. 100 humidifiers a day, you know, 10,000 of these things. It gets pretty boring doing the same thing over and over and over. But that got me, that networking, in fact, I got into that company, got me a job in the lab as a technician. So I worked with the design engineers on testing new appliances, toasters and electric can openers and pressure cookers and stuff, and also doing failure analysis. And one of my big learnings happened when I was in that job. I had analyzed a bunch of failed, failed uh, electric toothbrushes and uh, I came to the conclusion it was a manufacturing defect in our plant in Mississippi. So I wrote a telex. There was no such thing as email. It was a telex and said, uh, this is a manufacturing problem. Well, the guy that headed that up was a VP of manufacturing, very powerful guy in the company. And he called up my boss, who was just a manager level, and said, fire that guy. And my boss, who's two levels below him, said, why? Well, he wrote this report. Was, was he wrong? Well, no, he wasn't wrong. And my boss said, why would I fire him? Now, I was a technician. It would have been easy to get rid of me. It was a courageous move on his part to do that. And that was sort of, oh, people look out for people. It's really nice. But then I got into grad school. And I started in physics, and I realized I don't really like this. And I thought, what did I do at Presto? I was doing technician, engineering kind of work. I really prefer that. So I shifted to metallurgical engineering. And uh, in grad school, um, the stipend in those days was 3000 a year from uh, fellowships, and it never changed. And so that, even in those days, was pretty much poverty level uh, income. Uh, so we had another child. We bought a house. We managed. Um, the, the thing about, uh, I mentioned to, to Jack earlier, the thing about finding a, a mate is um, mate up. Find, a, find someone that's better than you are, that's, that's smarter. Because with Catherine's ability to, I mean, a wonderful cook and that sort of thing, but she could manage money and she could make anything work. That's the thing that, that has held us to this day as survival. This is 53 years later that we've been married. So uh, that's, that's one lesson. You know, choose, make good, and that convinced me I knew how to make good judgments. And every day I believe <laughs> that that was probably the best one I made. So, um, in grad school, I realized I hated doing research. You know, I thought I was going to be a research scientist kind of person, and I, it was too boring. It wasn't enough variety. So I got involved in outside stuff. I worked with Model Cities, which was an urban development renewal program at the time. I got involved with the kids' schools and a variety of other things, just a broader selection of interests. And I was thinking of going into teaching when I graduated. But well, first of all, there weren't many teaching jobs at that time, but also I, I stopped and thought, you know, I could teach from a textbook. I, I understand enough about metallurgical engineering and physics and thermodynamics and stuff to be able to teach this stuff, but it's all book stuff. It's not real life experience. So I thought, I'm not ready to teach. I got to get a job in industry. And I'm thinking, oh, how am I going to do that? And so my, my major advisor calls me one afternoon and says, hey, there's a company in St. Paul that's looking for a metallurgist. And I went over and interviewed. I, they, were, they also did electroforming in this company. So I had, um, this was Tuesday. On Thursday, I had the interview. And on Wednesday, I got a book on electroforming and read it. So that's how much I knew about electroforming. Uh, and I realized, looking back, that I have never once had a job that was advertised or posted. It has all been networking. So I mean, that's the first piece of advice to you. Don't necessarily, and you know, don't rely on the web. Don't just throw your resume out there and hope somebody will buy it. Start building relationships with people that can connect you to, to people in industry that might be helpful to you. Okay, networking. Um, the other message here, by the way, is uh, I'll get to that in a minute. So I, I did that job for a number of years, and and like my colleague Diane Chong from Boeing says, people go to companies because of the company reputation, and they leave because of their boss. And I, had, I ended up with the worst boss that I've ever had. And I decided, I'm going to leave this company. I'm going to find something else to do. Plus, I thought the company was, it was started the same year as 3M in St. Paul by some of the same kind of people. But 3M was shooting up, and this company had had wonderful inventions along the way, but they never capitalized on it. And I thought, I don't know what they did wrong, but I got to, 
I got to find out. So simultaneously, I got approached from another guy that used to work with me at about a, at a pacemaker company. He was now at a pacemaker company. He said, they need a metallurgist. We're going to do, we want to develop laser welding of pacemakers. We want to set up a corporate laboratory. I'd like to have you interview for that. So I did. And as soon as I started that job, I started an MBA. And it was to try to learn about, you know, what is marketing about, what is finance about, all that kind of stuff. So there was a big transition in career at that point. And within two years, I was product assurance director at the pacemaker company. It was a very fast move. And so I had, you know, 250 quality employees from incoming inspection to FDA dealings. And uh, I just loved it. It was a great, just a great experience. Um, and the MBA program, I found, you know, there was nothing magic about it, quite frankly. I focused on finance, so I did a lot of stuff on investments and, you know, mergers and acquisitions and stuff like that to understand why do companies buy other companies. It's usually not because of the dollars. It's usually because they're buying an expertise, like when Schlumberger, the study I did was on Schlumberger buying Fairchild. It was for their electronic capability, their integrated circuit capability to apply to downhole drilling uh, uh, measurement stuff. That was fun. And then my boss was one of the founders of the company, and he said, I've got another adventure I want you to look into. So I started getting involved with venture capital and startup companies, entrepreneurial stuff. And this is when I started to find, oh, back, uh, back to Buckview for a second. The first three, I was hired into R&D at, at Buckview, this, this electroforming company. And the first three weeks, I was put on a plane with a, a, a senior metallurgist. And this is a really old guy. He was 40 years old. OK? But from my perspective, that was pretty old. And, and we had a, a problem at a plant in Chicago that he treated stuff. And so I'm reading on the book. This is a great big metals handbook. They probably still have them around here somewhere. About how do you, what does a dissociated ammonia atmosphere work like and so on. I had never paid much attention to that. And, this, and Vic, this guy, says, what are you doing? He was from Chicago. I said, I'm just reading up in this atmosphere. He says, ah. He says, the technical stuff always gets solved. It's the people stuff that's going to bite you. So two years later, we're back and forth with this process going in and out of control. We go to lunch early and we come back early. And here's the plant maintenance guy going around between the ovens, cranking the knobs, throwing the process out of control. Why did he do that? So he could be the hero to fix it and get recognition. So it was a people problem totally. And so whenever something happens that doesn't seem technologically right, look, you know, check the first thing, an electric circuit, look for the fuse. Is that blowing? If it's, <laughs> or is the thing plugged in? Um, if, if, if you run into a technical problem, is, is there a people motivator in here that could, could be screwing this up? That was the first lesson. Two years later, I was in a meeting where the president was present, and I had proposed a new process for electroforming something. Um, I won't get into this. It's nickel mesh that's used in radar screens. And the president said, that's a great idea. And so I thought, man, I feel like a million bucks. You know, I'm recognized for this. And then he said, now go sell it. And I was pretty much dumbfounded. I said, OK, wait a minute. Even the president understands this, so it's got to be intuitively obvious. What does it mean to sell it? Who would I sell it to? What am I selling? And that question happened in 1973, OK? I will, when I get to 1986, I'll tell you I had the aha of what that meant, OK? And then that's what we'll talk about a little bit today. So I, I worked with venture capital for a couple of years. A lot of startup medical device companies did design of new products, um, something for closed wound suction, suction, something for autologous blood collection, another thing for monitoring respiratory stuff, a lot of fun kinds of projects. And then I met a company that was starting something new called Teltech. And it was a technical knowledge service, so that if you were an engineer in a company and ran into a problem that was outside your expertise, you could just call up an expert through Teltech, find an expert, and call them up and talk to them. This is before internet. And so I was employee number 11. And I was there for eight years. And there were 200 employees by the end of it. And we had about 2,000 clients across the US, including biggies like General Electric and Harris and other Lockheed and places like that, and little companies. And I managed the sales force in the eastern half of the US. Okay, So this is 1976. And when I started 
managing the sales force, I recruited a company called Wilson Learning. They teach sales relationship selling strategies. And I learned about what relationship selling was all about, and that was the aha moment. Oh, this is all about other people, it's not about me. And I gotta figure out how to get other people to buy in. We're gonna spend a little time just going through some of the, the mechanics of this. The fact is, I know if, if you are like, like me at your age, I would have thought sales, I don't wanna have anything to do with sales. You know, it's uh, used cars, it's whatever. It's not got a bad connotation. In fact, one of my salesmen said to me, why did you leave a high uh, profile or a high value profession like engineering to become a low value profession like sales? And I thought, well, it turns out actually at the time, sales is the, commission sales is the one place where women earn as much as men for the same performance. It's, a very, it's because if you're based on commission, you sell as much as I do, you bake as much as I do. So it is a, as an equity kind of thing, and my best salespeople are all women. It's, it's a great way to break into a profession. Okay. So um, after Teltech, I started teaching. One of my clients was a, a control data, and they were starting a new uh, graduate engineering program at the University of St. Thomas called Manufacturing Engineering, MMSE. And they needed somebody to teach the materials engineering course. And so I went over and introduced myself and started teaching as an adjunct. That was the break into academia. All right. And it's just pretty much random events, networking, talking to folks, it's, and just being alert. Oh, okay, that, I could have said, oh, I'm not interested in doing that. I wouldn't be here today. But I thought, oh, I'll follow it up. So if anything looks at all interesting to you, you know, kind of triggers your interest, follow up on it. At least check it out, because there may be something really fun in there, okay? So um, eight years later, I left Teltec. Oh, by the way, I was fired from a couple of jobs. Uh, that's the best thing that can happen to you. Uh, don't worry about that, okay? I just, it's how you react to the firing, that's, you know, and, and my son even today says, what I really liked is you got fired in the morning, you came home, and you started networking right away and had a job in no time. It's, it's just how, how you react to it. And it was just a fit. It was a poor fit for me in both instances. Um, so in, in 93, I, just, um, I left Teltec. I, I was tired of traveling. I would get on a plane in Minneapolis on Sunday night, and I'd travel to Orlando the next day, and then... Atlanta, then Boston, then Cincinnati, then Chicago, and get home Friday night. And then go to the office so I could catch up on the week's work and then leave on Sunday night again. Not a lot of, if for a while it's fun. It gets old, okay. So I like teaching and I thought, well, I'll, I'll see if there, I could get a job over there. So I went over and networked and the guy said, yeah, I can, we got some endowed funds here. We could cover you for a while, for a year to, get started and I started teaching there and and um, then they found a full-time slot created it and so I moved into that and then a year later somebody had uncovered a a, a plan for a, starting a bachelor's degree in engineering and they got approved by the faculty which was a miracle in itself by the way the argument there was we, we only offered BA degrees at St. Thomas at the time this would be a BS and for 30 years they hadn't offered a BS and so they were really opposed to it. And the, the issue wasn't engineering, it was BS, it was sort of, in many ways. Uh, so the, um, uh, here, make, make this happen. So I got a bunch of folks together, we put together a curriculum and started a BS in manufacturing engineering, which was not well researched and there wasn't a good market for it, okay? We found out three years later. But the next year, 95, the guy that I was working for was the director of the grad programs. He says, I'm leaving. So I've asked the VP and I'd like you to take over this job as director of the grad program. So within two years of starting out, hoping to just teach and have some fun, I ended up managing two the graduate and undergraduate programs. We built a wonderful advisory board with, I mean, some of my best mentors were Clint Larson from Honeywell. He was a corporate operations VP, wonderful guy. Uh, John Pavoni, who was uh, a VP of, manufacturing, of operations for uh, magnetic tape at 3M, started out as a researcher in 47 and built the whole industry. Um, Arnie Weimischkirch, who was head of the Baldridge Judges and corporate VP of quality. Some really wonderful people. 
And, and here's the trick to this, uh, building this advisory board was, I had a vision for, you know, St. Thomas's Liberal Arts College, we could build an engineering program where the students not only could do the technical stuff, but they could communicate and they knew a little bit about leadership and stuff like that. It had a value system associated with it. We wrote a mission and vision statement for the thing. And that's what attracted all those other people to join this, was we see this as something new. It, there was no private school with engineering in Minnesota. And uh, this was addressing a need that was being unmet. And so we got this wonderful group of supporters. And everybody kept selling it to other people. So uh, I was just lucky to be at the right place at the right time and stumbled into a situation where we could build something. The other thing is, we all came out of industry, all of us that um, were, were really leading this whole thing, and so we didn't know the academic rules, so we violated most of them. But the good news was we were small enough so nobody noticed. We were under the radar. And, and by the time we had built this program, it was too late, okay. So then we added electrical and mechanical engineering undergraduates. We added systems engineering and electrical and mechanical uh, graduate programs, a couple others. And, and now, this year, the number of undergraduate students entering St. Thomas is over, the engineering students are over 10% of the entering freshmen. My first class was three, two women and a guy. And so it is now the most profitable uh, school and, and we've, we convinced them to form a school of engineering in 2005 so it's the most profitable school in the university and the, sort of the star and it rose from uh, a lot of skepticism but it was all building relationships with the theology department the music department admissions alumni association the registrar everybody just getting them uh, engaged and it turned out of course this what we didn't know at the beginning was the engineering students were highly valued by all the other departments because they were really good students and so philosophy loved them, English loved them, everybody loved them to have them as students. So everybody got behind this. So that led to, um, you know, uh, in 2008, I, I had been functioning as dean since 95. At 2008, I stepped down. And I went to work for the state of Minnesota for the Min Minsku system. Uh, and they're as head of something called the Minnesota Center for Engineering and Manufacturing Excellence. And I worked with the state universities and state colleges for a couple of years, came back and taught, wrote a book, and um, then we technically retired in 2012. Um, but I w I've been in the mode of what my advisors told me, don't retire from a job, retire to something. And so now I'm probably doing more work than I did when I was teaching. Uh, but it's fun. It's stuff that I want to be doing. Okay. So the big turning points for me were, first of all, understanding Frank Sorrentino's uh, courage, his support of me of, you know, if you want employees to be loyal to you, you've got to be supportive of them. That's really important as a leader. Um, the, the other big one was Vicki Anish's, uh, well, it's the same kind of thing, his people thing. It's, it's all about people. Um, the, the technology is important, but you really have to learn how to work with people. The third one was the big aha about what does it mean to sell something, okay? So, is everybody still awake? Questions? We're gonna make this, the presentation stuff available, right? Yeah. Students can get it, okay. So, you know, anything's on a slide, you don't have to worry about writing down. But, but I'll tell you, there's even something more fundamental um, that we'll talk about, and that is uh, getting to know yourself, and we'll talk why that's important. Because you really understand who you are uh, before you can know what you want to be. And uh, I think I'll save that for a couple of slides from now. All right, so now let me just talk to you about um, this. Can everybody see the screen? Let's see if I turn this on, it probably would help. Okay, do you know what that is? I actually stumbled onto one of those on a visit this year in Abu Dhabi. That's a Bentley. It's a cool car, let me tell you. Okay. Um, so, so how many of you own cars or have cars of some sort? How many of you have ridden in a car? Yeah, probably everybody. No, okay. So the question is, if you're going to buy a car, what is the priority? Uh, which thing do you think is most important here? 
And I'd just like to have you each uh, uh, think about this for a second. Is it the performance of the car? Is it safety? Is it economy, appearance, durability, or comfort? OK? So for those of you with the first choice of performance, how many of you are say performance is the most important thing? OK, raise them high. OK. Gas mileage or, or overall operations cost? OK. How many think safety is the most important? The Volvo owners and the Ford owners. OK. How about economy? OK. Cool. There's pretty even distribution all the way along here. Whoops. Uh, appearance? All right, cool. Appearance. A durability? OK. The Hummer owners? And comfort? OK. Now, did you notice that there was somebody that thought each of those characteristics was very important? So what does that tell you? You just got to peek at it. It's this. People buy for their own reasons. Anything, whether it's a product, whether it's an idea, whatever. Each of us has our own set of priorities that, that determine what's, what is most important to us. And this is going to be true as you go through your career is you're going to be dealing with people who have different opinions than you for whatever reason. And the important point is to realize that and that if you want them to support your ideas, you've got to appeal to their priorities. OK? Follow that? Anybody want to question that? OK. It doesn't mean you have to agree with them. I'm not saying that. But you have to understand that they have different ideas. OK? Yes? How do you go about finding that out? Oh, you're wonderful. This is, this is what we're going to talk about. <laughs> OK. Here's the deal. What we can see about people is behavior. You can see how they react to things and so on. But all of these behaviors are driven by beliefs, which you can't see. And the trick is, beliefs come from, well, five major sources. Your family, religion, your friends, your work experience, your professional associations, uh, education, um, and of course the media. And the trickiest part, uh, here's another thing that I learned when I was about 40. Um, the family stuff often, incur, well, it includes your early years, before, you know, ages one through four or five or so, where you may not have real memory of what happened. Uh, and also, you may have heard things and misinterpreted them. You know, like, uh, well, there's, there's a lot of misinterpretations. But, but it's, it's stuff that's in there in your brain, and you may not know it's there. And for me, for me, it was pessimism. I was very pessimistic. And things were going well, and I couldn't understand it. So pessimism wasn't working. Okay. And I thought, why am I pessimistic when everything seems to be going pretty much the way I want it to go? And it dawned on me, it, my dad went into the, the Second World War just after I was born in 43. And I, my mother and I rented out our house, and we lived with my grandparents. And my grandmother was Irish and superstitious and very pessimistic. Nothing would go right. You know, they don't run with a stick and poke your eye. Well, it was everything. In fact, I mean, she said, don't study so much. It'll hurt your brain. Honest to God, I kid you not. So um, I thought, you know, I picked up pessimism from her because nobody else in the family was pessimistic. But I had spent so much time with her, that must have been what it was. And I said, I'm just going to get rid of this. And I have. And it was the right thing. It was just, but it was one of those beliefs I had that I didn't even know I had. So here's, uh, for your standpoint, and if you, um, we, we, in the book that, uh, that I'm going to refer to later that we wrote, the first section is on your myths and the beliefs that you have, a lot of which are not true. Um, there are reflection questions, how you can start to explore. So how do you find out, you, you first start to explore yourself. How do I find out how I feel? and what I believe, and why do I believe it, okay? Reflection is tough, um, but it really pays off. All right, so here's the segue. You're, what you're doing now in learning engineering is really the rear wheel of this bike. It's the technical skills that are really needed for you to be successful in an engineering kind of a career. But the front wheel is leadership, communications, uh, 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 emotional intelligence, those things 
that steer those technical skills in the direction you want them to go. But you need to know yourself and develop your own life living learning plan to be able to know how you want to steer your career. But we're going to talk about the front wheel, okay? Because the, 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 the rear wheel is being handled by all your technical courses. And this whole leadership thing is more about, from my point of view, the front wheel, okay? Okay, talk about selling. Um, we have one uh, alum who's at uh, Goodrich Aerospace, and he managed a project for the Airbus uh, and some other things. And when he, was, he said when he was a kid, uh, he would ask his dad, what am I going to be when I grow up? And his father would always say, you're going to be a salesman. And it just infuriated John. He just hated that thought. And, and after he started doing some things, they, they also did the B-1 and B-2 bomber and stuff, and they had some problems on the B-1, and John took a group together and, and said, let's change our whole process for doing this, uh, the next plane, and they got unit price way down and they got, you know, they were producing like one unit every six months and he got it down to one a day kind of thing. I mean, just with what he had learned about how to do lean manufacturing, essentially. And now he says, when people ask me, what do I do in my job? He said, I'm a salesman. I work with other people to meet their needs, to meet the customer's needs and so on. Okay. So the notion of selling that we're going to talk about, uh, and it has a lot to do with feelings, which is also something we aren't really terribly comfortable with. It's how do you get the feeling you want um, about, about the product and now the product could be an idea, it could be a project, it doesn't mean a physical product, okay? Or about themselves and mostly about yourself, okay? So here's the selling process. It's really simple. It isn't easy, okay? It's Watching Michael Jordan, you know, fly from half court and put a, make, dunk a basket is simple. Is it easy? <laughs> okay. It's that kind of notion. You can describe it, but it's hard, it's hard to do. There's four stages, and they have to do with developing trust, uh, having uh, the person trust, trust you that you're uh, proposing something that's useful, having them identify need that, yes, I do have a need for what you're proposing, and that's where it gets into what their beliefs are. Uh, find, help, will this really help me? Okay, there's a need, we have to reduce the cost of this particular product. Uh, that's the, the need part. Will your proposal help solve that problem? Is the help part. Does your solution solve it? And then the no hurry part is, well, we can wait till next month or next year to do this. You know, no, it's really more urgent than that. So it's an urgency issue. Okay. So those are the four stages. And and what you're doing in, in selling ideas is managing tension in, the, in a customer, in, the, in your colleagues. And the tension you're, you're driving is, uh, are two. One is relationship tension. You want the other folks to trust you and to believe you and believe you're going to be supportive and believe you know what you're talking about and all that kind of stuff. So that's the relationship part. And then the task tension is raising. You want to raise the task tension and say, this is important to do and we've got to do it right now. All right? So you want to minimize the relationship tension and maximize task tension, okay? And what happens is this. In that process, when you move from uh, trust to need to help, you, you sort of, you get them, you, you get relationship tension down, and then when they have to start making a decision, it goes back up. Oops, I got to commit to this thing. And then finally, it, it drops again, okay? And the task tension goes up. So th just a mental picture of there's a cycle here. All right, so now hooking behavior into this thing. We, uh, behavior is based on our beliefs, which we can't see, but you can see certain behaviors. And let me, how many of you are familiar with um, the stress strain curve in materials testing or advanced materials? Okay, so what do you, what do you measure in a stress strain curve? You measure either force and displacement or stress and strain. Two things, that's all you're measuring. And yet, what can you calculate? Yield strength, tensile strength, elongation, Young's modulus, resilience, toughness. You can calculate a whole bunch of stuff from just measuring two things, okay? That's what we're going to talk about because that's the power of this approach. Because what you need to be able to measure are, or observe are assertiveness and responsiveness. Those two characteristics in people. Once you get good at reading that, this is the part that's not easy, but once you get good at that, you can understand what 
uh, issues are most important to social style. Okay. So assertiveness is how you broadcast. Okay. So think of this in, in radio terms. Uh, and, you, and sometimes your, your speed and physical movement and, and voice. Okay. So that's assertiveness. Responsiveness is how you receive. Okay. Are you willing uh, to show your, your feelings when, uh, with others around compared to the rest of the population? You know, how, how willing do you receive information? You know, are you a deadpan poker player all the time? Or are you, that's great, kind of a person, that kind of thing? Okay, so those, if you plot those orthogonally, and oddly enough, you, you do the responsiveness upside down, okay, from normal coordinates, uh, you, you have a, uh, the definition of social style, which are called analytical, driver, expressive, and amiable. All right, now, first of all, this is like the bohr atom model. It's not a detailed model of how electrons travel around the nucleus, but it gives you a kind of a picture. It's not, it's not something you can bank on 100%, but I'll tell you, it gets you pretty darn close, if you understand this, to how people are going to behave and what you have to do to get them to be responsive. Um, and um, it's, it's pragmatically useful. And it, it isn't just four blocks. It's subcategories as and all of I think all of you probably did the social style inventory self inventory okay well there's you okay so let me just talk about this for a second first of all because you are in engineering and technical stuff the fact that there's a bunch of you that are analyticals 21 is no big surprise that's pretty predictable um, the fact that you are uh, people here is, and, and amiable, uh, a, a, a big part of the population is amiable, probably more than a quarter. There's, roughly it's 25% each, but there's, I think, a slight skew toward amiable. Uh, you want to work with people and you want to uh, get along and stuff like that. That's, that's a good thing. In fact, you know, some people think that leaders are always drivers up here. Well, I don't know, how many of you are familiar with who was the... Uh, commander in Europe theater in the Second World War from the U.S. Eisenhower? He was an amiable. So why do they choose an amiable to head up this whole operation? Well, if you heard of George Patton and Field Marshal Montgomery, they were drivers. And you needed somebody that could control them. I mean, you know, what did Patton want to do after he conquered Germany says, let's go to Moscow and take them out too. I mean, he just, he had a, a mission of, I got the tanks and we got the clear road, let's go do it. Uh, I said, wait a second, no, that's, we don't want to do that. So, uh, I mean, each social style has certain strengths. Now, here's an interesting thing. There aren't too many of you that are drivers, but there's some that have driver tendencies and some expresses. But you notice that, that even the drivers and, and the expressives have a strong, amiable, and analytical component, all right? Now the good news is, I, I think this, uh, this feels like a really accurate picture of this, of what you are likely to be. The good news is, um, this is all fine. The, 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 the news that you should be, take from this though is, when you get out in a company and you're dealing with people in uh, marketing and uh, finance and other places, you'll probably run into more social styles over here. And so you need to know how to work with them. And, and build relationships with them and, and develop them. So that's what we're gonna talk about is, okay, now how do I reach out beyond my classmates who I get along with great? And by the way, when you're building a team, the more diversity you can have in social style, the better, because you'll get different viewpoints and different reactions uh, and different ideas. And uh, Bill Wolf, who used to be head of the uh, National Academy of Engineering said, his take on creativity is, creativity is usually just taking one idea from here and one idea from here that have not been connected before and putting them together. And when you get a more diverse group of people, whether it's, it's social style diversity or age or ethnicity or gender or anything, you're likely to get a richer pool of ideas and therefore you have a better chance of coming up with something really creative. Okay, so you want diversity. All right. All right, so now how do we do, turn this into something practical? 
Well, the thing is, um, to build trust, you need to establish credibility. To, uh, to address need, you need to, um, you know, every product has a feature. This is black with a red button on it and so on. But uh, that's the feature. The benefit is I can advance things without being uh, up at the console. It's convenient for me. I can actually even walk around. Well, this thing is also like that. I can walk around the room and talk to you and, and not be, uh, that's the benefit stuff, okay? That addresses need. Then the help issue is addressed by musts and fears. Every, all of us, each social style has certain things they must have and some things they fear. They just cannot tolerate. They're just sort of the flip of each other, all right? And then finally, when, they're, when you're pressured into making the decision, the, the tendency, unless they're ready to buy, is to either fight you or run away, okay? So let's talk about how the, each of these social styles does that. So for credibility, drivers look for competence. Yes, you can do the job. And I, I was selling to a, a VP of research at um, uh, one of the big drug companies in New Jersey. And this guy was not only a drug company executive, but he was a New Jersey guy. And he just kept firing questions at me, and he wanted to see if I could keep track of what he was doing and keep up with him. And that was the credibility issue. Or, you know, am I competent at doing my job? So uh, Express was like commonality. Did you go to the same? I went to Central, University of Central Florida, too. All great, you know, the stuff like that. Or I play golf or whatever it might be. Amy both looked for positive intent. Well, you had the right idea. You know, it failed, but you, it was a good idea. And um, analyticals look for image. Are you dressed properly for your profession? Are you, do you speak correctly? Do you deport yourself right, properly? Okay. And so whoever you're dealing with, those are the kinds of things you need to address to cover credibility. For advantages, the, the, the thing called advantage is a business issue. So uh, again, analyticals look for investment. Uh, Amy Bulls would say, is this cheap? Is it inexpensive? Expressives look for ease. Is this easy to implement or do? And drivers look for, is this the best? Okay. So all those are slightly different. And, um, and then we'll take a look at, at the benefit side. Those are personal. Analyticals want respect. Drivers want power. Expressives want recognition. Bill, you did a great job. And amiables want acceptance, you know. So those are all different kinds of things on how you build the need issue. Then for the must, you know, analyticals have to be correct. My wife is is an analytical. I never thought that. She's an artist, artist, artistic and very creative writing and stuff. But she calls me up every time I screw up saying something, which happens pretty often, it turns out. Um, amiables like to be loved. Drivers have to win at any cost and express those on comfort. And the fears are just the flip sides of those. You know, analyticals don't want to make mistakes. That would be the worst possible thing. So when you're trying to get them to go along with this, if you're selling a project to an analytical and say, well, what if this is a mistake, you know? How do you help them get over that and say, that's not going to be a mistake. We're going to be correct. And you're going to provide the data that will show that we're, this is viable, okay? So, how do I get a sense of, I'm going in to sell. Yeah. And I'm going to sell to you. Yeah. And I'm not going to have you fill out the survey. Yeah. <laughs> How do I get a sense of who you are? You um, know, how do I know you're an analytical or an expressive? You know, what's the... You, you, you have them fill out the survey, but that's not what you call it. Uh, that's a really good question. I mean, it, it, the selling process that we used is you start with, um, I'd like to tell you about our service, but first I'd like to find a few things about you. Could, could I just ask a few questions? You don't mind if I take a couple notes? And you develop a series of questions that give you hints about what's important to you. You know, how, how is business going? You have a question? Yeah. Oh, okay. How is business going now? Uh, where, you know, we, we have an in technical knowledge service. You know, do you, do you have any particular issues that you're working on now that aren't being easily resolved with the S skill set you have inside? Stuff like that. And, and Socratic questioning is the most powerful tool there is. So uh, we were talking earlier about having the right answers, I think. And, and, the, and as technical people, we're trained to have the right answers, but as leaders, we should be asking the right questions and not 
have the right answers necessarily. Yes? What is the question? Oh, just uh, tell me more about that. Uh, ask a question and then follow up on the questioning. Not give an answer. It's like what you do if you have a teenage daughter that says, I have a problem. You don't say, oh, here's the answer. You say, well, tell me more about that. <laughs> OK. Yeah, it's, it, 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 Socrates' approach to, to teaching was to have people talk about their stuff. Quite frankly, people talk themselves into things. Okay, so you want you want people to talk because the more they talk, uh, the more they will convince themselves this is a good idea. Okay, so oh, then just really quickly, the 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 trick in this whole thing is under stress we behave in different ways. And uh, there, there's first of all, the fight and flight is people become either they fight, they're autocratic or attacking or or they're acquiesce. But if you're under pressure, people change social styles in their fight and flight response. And it moves horizontally, diagonally, and horizontally. No matter where you start, <clears throat> go horizontal, diagonal, and horizontal. So if people are behaving really strangely, not the style you think they are, it's probably because they're under a lot of stress. And so time out or whatever, OK? All right, so here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just close with this. Because this is the single most important. The selling stuff was my aha, but it's part of emotional intelligence. And emotional intelligence is just being able to understand the emotions of others and that they play in this game and, and, how, you, and how your behavior affects them. The research, this is really good research. It's been done for quite a number of years. Shows that intelligence, IQ, is responsible for a smaller percentage of success of people than emotional intelligence. And Bill George, who was in fact the CEO of Medtronic, said he has seen people with low IQ succeed, but never anyone with low EQ. Okay, so these are basically the fundamental components of emotional intelligence. Uh, the self-awareness, the reflection, the knowing about yourself, uh, what are your own beliefs is a big part of it, self-regulation, uh, the example I like to use is ma time management and money management. You know, know how to use 15 minute scraps of time and know how to, um, that, that wealth is not, a, not major, is not primarily just making a lot of money, it's the difference between income and outgo and managing the outgo, uh, not buying two jet skis and a couple of Bentleys and stuff like that. Um, your motivation, do you do things because it's important to you to do or is it just for the money? You know, what's your, what's your internal motivation? Do you have empathy for other people and your social skills? So. So I'm going to ask one question. Yes. So engineers in this room, do they all need to be, how is each one of these engineers a salesperson? Or are they just, it's only for that sales engineer role? Yeah. Well, the notion of sales for you all is that you are going, you are a team. You're working on teams yet? How many of you are working on teams here? Some of you. Whenever you're working with a team, you, you may have a different idea than somebody else on the team and think your idea is pretty good. How do you get others to buy into it? Uh, and and if, if you are asking them Socratically questions, well, how does your approach, how's that going to work out? How would my approach work out? You don't have to push what your approach is. Just say, how do you think this would work out? What do you see as the weaknesses in it? And, and if you can get people to talk about that, what are the weaknesses in your approach, you can go back and say, well, maybe I can fine tune this a little bit and come back, well, I address those weaknesses. You know? it, is, it gives you the leverage of, of, being, of asking questions in your team and leading by asking questions and getting others to follow you and get them to say, oh, that is a good idea after all. That's what you want, okay? Or collectively, I mean, the whole team may, come to a different conclusion than any individual member. And if you can kind of shepherd that to get to the best conclusion that everybody can buy into, that's really good. I had, well, I'll, I've got a number of stories along those lines. Okay. So he's given us a whole bunch about work. And there's at least 15 things, 16 things <laughs> I caught that weren't on the slides. And I'll share those with you. But before we kind of close, I hope you caught the other things. I mean, maybe, maybe it's the front wheel. People look out for people. We need to marry up. My wife would probably agree with that I married <laughs> up. It's how you react to situations. You need to know who you are. You need to know yourself. You've got to understand your beliefs. We've got to know how to use 15 minutes. 
And maybe the other cool thing is everyone loves engineers. Ladies and gentlemen, Ron Bennett. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.